Thank you. Welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, yeah, we're a little discombobulated tonight. Um, this uh, weekend, there will be um, several activities related to Juneteenth. So my guests uh, tonight are Jean Jordan, who's the president of the New London branch of the NAACP, and Aileen Novick, who is the program director for Hempstead Houses in New London, which is um, part of Connecticut Landmarks. So uh, we're going to talk about the activities to come and other issues. So welcome, ladies. I'm glad that we all got together again. Thank you. Um, I guess before we, we start looking at slides and specific activities, maybe you can talk a little bit about the history of Juneteenth. Uh, it's a little bit more known now than it was maybe five, ten years ago, but I think there are still a lot of people that don't really know what it's about. Okay, well Juneteenth commem commemorates the announcement by Union soldiers in Galveston, Texas that they were free. That happened on June 19th in 1865. And that's when they found out that the Civil War had ended and then the enslaved people were free. Now if you notice I said in 1865, when was the Emancipation Proclamation? So really, well, it doesn't help to be freed if you don't know it. Exactly, exactly. And there are a couple of different stories about why it took them so long to find out. One was that the messenger didn't make it. Another was that he did make it, but they decided not to let them know because economically, if they were told that they were free, they would walk off and hence um, production would stop in the fields. So. We don't know for sure what really happened, but we know that they didn't find out until a lot later than everyone else. Wow. And, and I think that there's sort of a lesson there in general that sometimes there are laws that protect us, but if they're not enforced, if they're not known, you know, there really isn't benefit of it. Right. So uh, I know New London has had Juneteenth uh, commemorations for quite a long time, uh, but it's been in conjunction with the Hempstead Houses for the last three, three or four, years. three four or four years. years. This will be the fourth, fourth year. year, yeah. Fourth year. And it seems like it's become a more and more elaborate event almost every year. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, or a lot, because we have plenty <laughs> of time, talk about what people, um, can expect over over this weekend. And this year it is truly the weekend. Last year we did Saturday and we did a church service on Sunday, which Sunday was a half day. This year we start on Friday night, Saturday, Saturday evening, and Sunday and Sunday afternoon. So it's truly a weekend. Saturday, Friday night we start with Joseph McGill, who's from the Slave Dwelling Project, and he will be staying with Aileen <laughs> and some community members at the Hempstead House Friday night. Oh, They're wow. having a sleepover. Wow, that Jean was great. invited. Yes, I was <laughs> invited, but I have allergies. Oh yeah, so the Hempstead House doesn't work for you. No, it doesn't work for me. Yeah, this is what he does. He goes around the country trying to stay at different places where enslaved people dwelled and bringing attention to them. He's um, based out of South Carolina. And um, this is his mission is to stay at every single place where enslaved people were that's still there. And so um, he's only been to one other site in Connecticut. He started there in Greenwich. He stayed at the Bush Holly site a few years ago. Wow. Yeah. So he's trying to do more northern sites. And so we were very happy to get him. I've been trying to get him to come to New London for a while now. And, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but that whole Hempstead Street neighborhood was right. really very significant in, in the history of, of freed slaves. Hence, that's why we were happy four years ago when Barbara and Aileen came to us about starting up Juneteenth again, because it is a historic neighborhood for the African Americans in New London, and it, it's only fitting that we continue to have Juneteenth in that neighborhood. Yeah, I remember some small events at Riverside Park many years ago, but I don't think there was the same connection that you have. Right, we've had them on Riverside Park, we had them downtown New London, we had them on Trum, um, Black Hall Street, but I think now, I think we're, we're really settled. This is where it needs to be. Because a lot of the houses on Hempstead Street were uh, occupied by freed slaves. Right, and they, um, 
the civilian so hailing, hailing houses. houses. Yeah, he was an abolitionist who built, there are still four houses there on Hempstead, four or five, that he built. We just did a walking tour this weekend. Um, you know, he bought the land, and then the land lots themselves were $600, and he had these houses built, and he sold them for $700 because he realized that people were not selling, they weren't giving mortgages to the free blacks. And so there were a lot of tradesmen that really right. purchased those houses and lived there a long time. In fact, one of the youth who will be staying at the Hempstead House Friday night lives in one of those houses. Wow. So. It's still a, a, a neighborhood that is you now really diverse. Yes. As opposed to some of the New London neighborhoods. I went to that uh, program that New London Landmarks put right. on a couple yes. of months ago, and it was really quite shocking that, you know, down in the south end of town that like you couldn't sell your house to a Greek or or Jewish or a Jew, yeah. So we just would, would have been out of luck. It was <laughs> the <laughs> cutoff point was Willits Avenue. So if you could live before Willits Avenue, you could not live after Willits Avenue. Wow, I'm glad to see times have changed that 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 way at least. So so what's in store on um, on uh, Tuesday? On, not on Tuesday on Saturday. Well, continuing on oh. Friday night, we still we have the campfire. Right, Ooh. Joseph McGill at 7 p.m. will be at Hempstead Houses, hopefully outside. We're gonna have a campfire where he can talk about his work around the country and we can talk a little bit about the enslaved people at Hempstead Houses. And now, is I have a slide here. Is this Joseph McGill? I do not know. That is Joseph McGill. Okay. Yep. That is him, so he'll be traveling here. And now, does he do this year round? Just Going he does. To different sites? You know, he's a historic preservationist based out of South Carolina, so that's his main job. Um, but he does this on sort of a side. It, it started because at Magnolia Plantation in South Carolina, they were trying to preserve the slave dwellings that were there, and they were having a lot of trouble calling attention to it. So he decided to have this sleepover and invite people to come um, to draw attention so that people would donate and want to preserve those dwellings. And so that's how he started, and now he's just going around the country. If you go to the website, this Slave Dwelling Project, you will see the list of all the places where he will be this year. It seems particularly a timely time to do it because it seems as though we're reading about how history books are really trying to make that part of our history kind of disappear. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't in the history books to begin with. Wow. So. Right, yeah. especially in the North. You know, a lot of people are surprised to hear, you know, when they hear about New London, one person living in the house with the family. Because still to this day, when you, the kids' books all mostly talk about Southern plantations, the North has done a really good job of sort of hiding the slavery history here. So people don't know a lot of the specifics about what it looked like up here. And part of the reason for that in the history books is that history books and publishers base what they do on the states that buy the bo most books, and that tends to be Texas. Yeah. So you, you have a history that is slanted towards what they want to teach their students in Texas and California, so you do see a lot more about the southern states, and when you do see history about the north, it's not as accurate as it could be. Yeah. I'm in, in general, I think history is probably tough because so much happened and you're picking and choosing, but it seems as though we have not always done the best job of picking and choosing. Right. Um, yeah, I have a slide here that just sort of gives a summary of what's happening uh, on Saturday and Sunday. And um, yeah, both days seem pretty full of, of activities, and I notice everything is free as well. Yes. yes. Um, now, th this weekend, or that, is it the whole weekend, or, or just Saturday the 9th, that is a free admission day for all of the Connecticut The whole week. Well, it's just both days. Both days. Both days. Yep, and Friday. Yeah, we have a generous grant from the Frank Loomis Palmer Fund that's really helping to support Juneteenth this year, and we in conjunction with Connecticut Open House Day, which will be throughout the state on Saturday, where a lot of cultural institutions are either free or offering a discount. Um, we always have Juneteenth on Open right. House Day, so everything would be free. And then we expanded it for the whole weekend. So what is um, in the works for Saturday? Oh, we have a lot going on. We have 
Lillian Cook and her Lion's Den dancers are coming back. They've been very popular every year, so they will be there. Tammy Denise will be doing will Joan, she, Jackson. Joan Jackson, who is Adam Jackson's mother. We have Writer's Block Inc. will be sending a few performers to do some spoken word pieces. Dwight Baldwin, and he has a couple of different bands. So. Shades, Shades of, Joy. of Joy will yes. be there. They did a great job last year. People really enjoyed listening to their music. And we have DJ yeah. Frank Lowe again. Expressionis will be there to do an art project with the children. They will be doing a banner like they did the first year. Yeah, they do really fun community murals yes. at this event. Ajua Asante Bandali will be there doing Harriet Tubman. And people can just come and go all day. Yep, they can come and go all day. We will have some vendors there. We will have food, of course, for sale. Um, there will be social service agencies. I think the library will be there. Yep, we have the library. library. Fresh New London will be there. And this year, because it's in conjunction with OIC and they're really manning the main food tent, we have blocked off that one block of Hempstead in front of the OIC. So we'll have the New London fires coming with a fire truck for the kids to see. And there'll be the food tent where people can eat in the middle of the street. I know their OIC well, is planning some right. kids' activities in the street. So it really isn't just on the Hempstead House's no. grounds. No. That whole it's always been on both sides of the street. But this year, we were lucky enough to have the street blocked off from Truman to the Hope Street. Hope street. Oh, great. Yeah, and there'll be some health fair activities in the OIC building, the Lions Club. They're going to do free eye screenings. Um, I know there's going to be Access Health, Health is going to be there. Yeah, CT Access Health will be there. So, yeah, this year I will be in town for it. Now, you, you sent me some photos. I'm thinking they're, they're probably from last year, and they I are. have some older uh, photos of, of. That's the Lions Den dance troupe. That's Dwight Baldwin and his group, Shades of Joy. With Wait. Tammy Denise, who does Joe Yeah, with Tammy Denise standing there in the middle. Too. <laughs> Dwight Baldwin has been doing this forever, hasn't he? Since the year one. Yeah. yeah. Those are some of the kids' activities. That's, um, we put out some of our historic toys. So there's Philip Hyman, one of our interpreters, and he's getting the kids going with some hoops. There is a lot for families to do. They're going to have face painting this year over at OIC, um, there's games, NAACP has a booth with Drop-In Learning Center, they right. always give We away. have some books that we will be giving away, and I have some special books that I will be giving out randomly called 10 African American Men Who Changed the United States, Who Changed America. So we will be randomly giving out books, and we will also randomly be giving out copies of the Young Readers edition of Hidden Figures. So. Oh, neat. Wow, that's great. See. That's Adjua doing Harriet Tubman. Now, is this something that she'll be in costume in that role all day, or are there specific performance times? There are specific performance times. Adjua, we have scheduled for about 3.15, um, so she'll be then. Um, we have the Lion's Den Dance Company is on for 12.30, oh. um, Writer's Block at 1.15. If you have, um, we're planning to start Joseph McGill. A lot of people are interested in what right. time is he talking. Um, we're planning to start him about 1.30 p.m. And we're first going to start with him and Tammy Denise because she has a company where she portrays all these different women, a lot Connecticut-focused or New England. Um, and so they're women that often get lost to history. And so, you know, she really makes a point of doing these women that she calls sort of hidden women where their stories haven't been told. And so we're going to have them sort of as a panel talking about why they think it's important to preserve these stories. You know, because a lot of people ask Joseph McGill as an African American man why he wants to go stay at, at all these places where enslaved people lived. Um, and so he's going to talk about why he was, is really trying to bring attention to that and why it's important to save those stories and make sure that people know about them. So that's around 1 or 1.15? One 1.30, yeah. he'll start. Yep. Yep. And let's... Oh, Dwight again. That's Tammy Denise. Yep, inside the house. She does a great job portraying um, Adam Jackson's mother, who was an interesting woman in New London who receives her freedom when Adam Jackson's about three years old. But in order to be a free woman, she has to leave Adam and his sister Miriam, who's about one year old. 
Um, and so she really tells that story, and she gets placed in and out of slavery in New London. Um, and so that's in the 1700s. When her son Adam is born in 1700, he's third generation enslaved in New London. Wow. Which surprises people. And it does. people don't know this. Yeah. And, and the choices to right. have to make. It's like you can be free, but you, we, we, keep your, we keep your kids. Right. And so the children she has once she's free are supposed to be free because it went with the status of the mother. But because she gets put back and forth into slavery, things are really complicated for her family. And so her husband, John Jackson, who's been free before, spends a lot of time in his life trying to get the rest of his family free. Not the two, Adam and Miriam, because they were born into slavery, but trying to get that family out of this legal case. And so there's a lot of information about that family that Tammy uses to tell the story of the Jackson family. It's a great story, and I, I, it should be a movie. It's, you know, as she, Aileen said, it's very complicated. But it, it shows the history of slavery in this country and how people were enslaved. It's our version of 12 Years a Slave. And, you know, I, I don't think any of us really imagine what the details involved in everyday life that, you know, complicated. Um, like tr trying to get keep a family together if some are enslaved and some are free. Right, you couldn't keep the family you, together. It was impossible. I know there are stories about how slaves visited their wives, but I often wonder how really true that was. Right, and if you look at this, like New London, if you go through the census, you can see there's just one or two enslaved people per house. The majority had one enslaved person. So the North, a lot of people think, oh, the families were kept together, but no. all you have to do is see that, and you think, well, each of those houses, then your family is somewhere else in town because you're the only one in living with a white family. Northern slavery wasn't much different than Southern slavery when you get right down to it. I mean, we kind of try and whitewash it, but it's slavery, slavery, regardless of where it's at. And I can just imagine, well, I can't really just imagine what, it, what it's like if you just have a single family member and others have more freedom, but you have the, the close family ties. It, it, it is almost as though everyone is enslaved. They, they, they are, basically. They are, because you have a mother who doesn't have her children. But she had to make a, a choice of, do I continue this life, or do I try and do better and possibly, at some point, get my children back? So you said it was a complicated story, and they, there isn't a movie yet, but do her children remain slaves all their lives, or did they ever extricate themselves no. as time went by. John Jackson is able to free um, his wife, and actually he even goes through the Massachusetts court system. There's an amazing wow. amount of documents. Um, there's even a deposition in New London that he puts his mark on, which is unusual. Um, you know, people are always saying, oh, there aren't any documents. And so, you know, there's that book, For Adam's Sake, in which Allegra de Bonaventura really uncovers all these documents about the family. And so they are able to free a number of the children. And sometimes you even find John Rogers, um, who was a Rogerine, who sort of had his own group yeah. down there um, in Mamacoke. But some of his family members um, are occasionally listed as taking in some of her children. But they think because they were living at Mamacoke that maybe that was a way to try and keep them out of other possession while they were trying to settle this case. Oh, interesting. And we know. Adam Jackson was a slave still when Joshua Hempstead passed away. So, right, he yeah, was, he, he was a very old man. Yep. When Joshua Hempstead dies in 1758, you find Adam Jackson listed in the inventory, um, but you don't find him in the will. But somehow later in his life, he's 58 then, you do find him on the New London census as a free man, but no one knows how that came to be because he wasn't free hmm. legally in the will, so we don't know if it was the Hempstead family that decided or if somehow he was able to you buy, know, his freedom. buy his freedom. It's actually chilling when you just said in the will he was listed as part of the inventory. That's what they did, That's what yeah. he was. Shows you how much he was worth also. Right. Was it like two, two shilling? Two pounds. He two was pounds. purchased originally for 85 pounds, and it's listed him as old Negro man. Wow. And he's listed amongst all these objects that were part of the estate. 
And I have an, another photo wow. of... Um, those are the children working on the mural. Yep, those are some of the kids that participate in the Hempstead Youth Group, and that's the Expressiones mural that they did last year, which really had a maritime focus. Right. And um, let's see, did we miss any of the daytime? Um, no, but nighttime no. is going to be really interesting. Yeah, in fact, I even did make a slide, sort of, but you'll well, we're gonna have those we'll be Marshall. able to talk more Let's about Marshall. We, we are lucky, mm -hmm. thanks to our NAACP First Vice President and State Criminal Justice Chair, Tamara Lanier, we have Michael Koskoff, who is the screenwriter, along with Jacob Koskoff, of Marshall. And Michael Koskoff is a lawyer in Bridgeport. And this has been like his passion project, is to get this story out. I was fortunate in that I saw this pre-release last July. And I had the opportunity to be there when they had a discussion with Chadwick Boseman, uh, Reginald Hudlin, who's the director, and Roland Martin, discussing this movie last July. So we um, are very fortunate to have Michael Koskoff come and do a discussion about the movie with us. When I saw the movie, I had no idea it took place in Connecticut. All I knew was it was a movie about Thurgood Marshall and Chadwick Boseman was the person who played James Brown previously. That's all I knew going into it. And I know nothing. Any other, you know, from before Thurgood Marshall was on the Supreme Court, I have, have to admit I know nothing about his life or what his background was. Well, he was an attorney for the NAACP and he came to Connecticut um, to help with a case that took place in Bridgeport and he worked with a Jewish lawyer. And this tells the story of the case and what took place between Thurgood Marshall and the lawyer and the city of Bridgeport here in Connecticut. Yeah, it really focuses on just this four weeks uh, early in Thurgood Marshall's Joe career Fair. where he's defending this African-American chauffeur who's accused by a Greenwich socialite of kidnapping and rape. And so he defends him against those charges and it was really on the pages of the paper because it was really you know this she's a socialite and sort of it made all the tabloid papers this poor man who she accused yeah it was basically tried in the newspaper mm -hmm. but it also tells a story of the relationship between Thurgood Marshall and the lawyer and like as I said we are very fortunate to have Michael Koskoff to come to New London on Saturday evening to discuss the movie and his reasons behind wanting to write the screenplay. It sounds great. Right. So we will be outdoors Saturday night, 7 p.m. under the tent. If it rains, we will go inside the OIC. Okay. And I have just some old photos uh, that I'll go through really quickly of past year's uh, celebrations because the new photos I got 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, my e I had an email fail. Um, so these photos, I think, are, are, might be from 2016, maybe even 2015, I'm not sure. That's yep, the these year. are from the first year, yep. Uh, yep, that's yep, McKinley, Winston. McKinley Winston. Yep, because Winston. The first oh, year yeah. we did this, the hospital, Ellen M. Hospital was one of the sponsors oh, yeah. with us. Mm -hmm. It was the NAACP, the Hempstead Houses, and Ellen M. Hospital. And I think McKinley was on the show talking about it. Um, so yeah, this might, these might be from 2015. Yeah. That's the Lion's Den. Yep, they performed every, every year. year, which is great. So yes, and, and actually I did have one other picture just about of all the other houses that uh, Connecticut Landmarks has because uh, Saturday is a free admission day wherever. Exactly, yep. Yeah. yeah. So um, now on Sunday, what's the schedule? Sunday starting at 1130, we will have an outdoor church service on the grounds of the Hempstead House. This is our second year. Um, in His Presence Ministries with Reverend Joyce Pollard and Reverend Herman Pollard will be doing the service and that's from 11.30 to 1 p.m. And after that, we have churches coming in, their church choirs or their praise groups coming in to perform. We have 
I'm going to call the church by the wrong name because it's changed names, <laughs> but it's on Coleman Street. They used to be the Tree of Life. Oh, yeah. I don't remember. I just passed it too and right. noted that they it was have a, a name new change. name. Yes, they have a men's group that's coming. We have Mount Moriah, Holiness Baptist Church coming. We have St. John's Christian Church from Groton, Connecticut. And am I missing? Yes. Um, we have Mr. Adam Fletcher, hopefully he's been ill, so we're hoping that he will be able to join us and sing. So that's at 11.30 to 1, of course. That's 11.30 to 1 is the church service. 1 o'clock on are the groups that I yes. just mentioned. So really, um, and, and, and that all goes on until about 4 o'clock. Sunday is 3? Yeah, we think Sunday of most three. people. Yeah. Okay. Four seems long for people. We think yeah. about one to three. Yeah. Yeah. Should be really nice. It is going to be. Hoping for great weather. <laughs> yeah. Did you get rained on at your neighborhood tour last weekend? We, our neighborhood tour got thunder and lightning out, so we had to postpone until Sunday. <laughs> uh, I was on a tour at, at uh, the Arboretum, but we did it in the morning, and it was just hot and humid. Yeah, yeah. the morning was sunny. Yep. Yeah, it was a little too hot, actually. It was hot. But, uh, but yes, the afternoon tours were, were definitely eff affected by the rain. Yes, that was a lot of rain. So yeah, it's, it seems like a great weekend and like something for everyone. The movie sounds really interesting. I, we're really excited about being able to do this movie because we tried to do the movie in the fall. We had the opportunity to show the movie pre-release, but we could not work out all the details. So we're happy to be able to show it now because the movie was not shown right away in the New London area. Mm. And that's a problem a lot of times with certain movies coming out. They don't get shown in our area. So we are very happy to be able to do this for the people who haven't had a chance to see it. And it's kind of a Connecticut story. It, yes. it is a Connecticut mm -hmm. story. Although I feel pretty remote from Greenwich, but still. <laughs> Um, I guess um, I wanted to talk to you both about your organizations too, and not just about uh, this weekend's uh, events. So can you talk uh, a little bit about the New London NAACP and what your mission and, and programs are? Okay, our mission always is, you know, making sure that everyone has their civil rights, regardless of their, you know, race. We have had a busy year. We've been doing prayer breakfast, which we did our first one, Martin Luther King weekend, and it was so popular, they asked that we do it monthly. <laughs> and wow. I said, I can't do that monthly. <laughs> 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 we can't do it. So we compromised, so we will do four a year. We'll do one each quarter. Our second one fell in line with the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. We also did that same week, we did a reading of a letter to Birmingham from Birmingham jail. I have to thank Eva Menon for that and she had me, invited me to read with them in East Lyme and I said we need to do this in New London and the perfect day is, and we did it April 4th on that anniversary day at St. James Church. We have our um, Freedom Fund dinner coming up the end of this month, June 28th. We and I actually have a slide, but it's a photo from it's last year. It's from last year. year. That's all right. That's all right. It's June 28th this year. And we have Carlton Giles, who is the chairman of the pardons and paroles, is our guest speaker because um, criminal justice reform is very much needed and Connecticut and the Connecticut NAACP have led the way in that across the country. We have, um, we are honoring five New London men. We are honoring Mr. Luther Simons. We are honoring Mr. Spencer Buddy Lancaster, Reverend Herman Pollard, John Harris, Albert Garvin. And these are all men who have been the backbone of New London as many of us were growing up. Three of them, I think, are now 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the others aren't far okay. behind. So it's past time that they were recognized. And they're not men who go out and toot their horns. They don't talk about what they do. 
but they have been there for those of us in the African American community as we grew. They were our spiritual advisors. They were the people who taught us about sports. They, we, you know, we had our, our fun uncle out of that crowd. So it's, they covered everything that a, a child in New London would need, the kind of mentoring they would need. So we're very honored to be honoring them. We are also honoring Shirley Gillis, who, as you know, was former right. Connecticut State Teacher of the Year. And while we talk about Johanna Hayes being the first African American Teacher yeah. of the Year, they only do one Teacher of the Year now. When Shirley was Teacher of the Year, they had the first one, second, and third, and Shirley was third nationally as Teacher of the Year. And I remember that because I remember coming home from college on the train, opening up Good Housekeeper magazine, and looking and seeing Shirley, Shirley. Gillis's picture. It's like, Shirley's in here. What is, what's going on? Why is Shirley in my Good Housekeeper magazine? And she was um, nationally third Teacher of the Year. Well, now she taught at Harbor School. She taught at Harbor for, School. For how many decades? Um, 30 something years. Wow. Yes. So she will be one of our honorees. I know when I was uh, teaching Head Start, a lot of my students had Shirley as their kindergarten yes. teacher. In fact, Ajua <laughs> is was one of my mother's TVCCA students who went yeah. on to Shirley's kindergarten. So they're all throughout the community, those students. They're, they are. I, I, I know I retired from, from Head Start like almost 10 years ago. and. I come across kids from, you know, from when I worked there in the 80s, 80s. when I worked with your mom at Home Street. The and uh, yeah, and then later on as a home visitor. And, you know, the scary thing is that I've had some of my mother's four year olds' kids in the New London Public Schools. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> But it happens. Yes. And, I mean, it's good in a way. There's such continuity. But uh, yeah, sometimes I had some second generation kids. And oh my gosh, did that make me feel old? Yeah. So Shirley is one of our honorees. Um, the dinner, as I said, is June 28th. It's $65. We will not be accepting people at the door. We, um, so you need to get yourself money in by June 25th. Now, is there going to be like online ordering, or is there um, a place to mail? I a haven't check done to? online ordering. We um, we sent out notices. Okay. We also put it on Facebook. But our address is New London NAACP, mm -hmm. PO Box nine eight seven, New London, Connecticut. Okay, and sixty five dollars. Sixty five dollars a person, six hundred a table. And I know it's a great event. I. Don't, I, some years I'm not in town, last but year, last year was fantastic. Last year we, we sold out, and this is why I can't do people at the door the day of, because it was trying to get every, you don't want to turn anyone down, but it's too stressful to try and get them in at the last minute. Right, and the fire marshal would probably complain if you Yes, and Ocean Beach has been wonderful, but it's also not fair to them. Right, catering, yeah. 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 <laughs> So yeah, the Freedom Fund dinner is uh, the big thing that's coming up after the Juneteenth. Right. The, um, now, can you talk a little bit about the youth projects? Because I've seen the NAACP youth um, at a couple of, of events throughout the city, and they're really pretty impressive. Right, they, the youth are their own chapter. They are their own separate branch. Um, Riona Dice and Lachelle Gillers are the advisors to the youth. We, anyone can become a member of the NAACP. You can be a member from birth. In fact, Riona Dice, her grandson, who is six, has a lifetime membership. <laughs> He's six, he has his lifetime membership already. So it doesn't, age doesn't make a difference, but our youth group, basically we take them at middle school, high school, and this year we actually have some of our college students with us because they're going to college locally, which is really nice. They are very well trained, and I know this because other people in the city have commented on how they want them to be involved in their activities. Um, they are working on, right now, we are going to be working on the political action 
because this year is an election year, while the NAACP does not come out in support of anyone, we do do other things politically, and they will be working on that. I know Riona went to a training on Saturday about that. We have some of the youth will be sleeping at the Hempstead House Friday night with Aileen. In fact, they just gave me <laughs> some more names. I have one youth who is interested in being our representative for the City Police Community Relations Committee. Oh, wow. So, because we have a seat on that. It doesn't make a difference. He's over 18, so we're looking at that. They, they, they are very impressive. They're very impressive. They're doing a lot of work where they're volunteering at the soup kitchen, but they're, they, they are really impressive kids. Now, you mentioned that it's an election year and you can't obviously uh, support candidates, but of course you can bring up issues. Right. And you mentioned earlier something about criminal justice reform being one thing. Uh, what kind of other issues is the NAACP working on? Well, right now, as I'm sure you saw in the newspaper Sunday, we're working on complaints regarding the Coast Guard Academy. That's oh. been a long time coming, and we have tried unsuccessfully to meet with our Connecticut delegation. So we had to go to D.C. and meet with Congressman Benny Thompson, who is the ranking chair, House ranking chair of the Homeland Security. Coast Guard Academy falls under Homeland Security. And he was very concerned about the issues that we have raised. They are not new issues, and he knew that. So he is hoping to, at some point, come up here and work with us and work with the Connecticut delegation to see if we can, you know, help the Coast Guard Academy. And thinking about this, you said it isn't an, a new issue, and, and I do recall that even several years ago I, I read that compared to the other service uh, academies, the Coast Guard Academy has had a more difficult time getting a diverse student body and also being supportive of the diverse student body. Right. This year, I think they had their largest African-American class ever, 18. Yeah, that's not, still not a high number. Well, it's, it's, but it's their largest. And one of the issues is people don't understand when you're the only one, it's difficult for you. And when you have people who make comments that are racist, and they may not think they're racist, but they are, it makes it harder for you because if you complain, you get branded a certain way. So it's difficult. If you're 18 young African-American Latino people, in a group of say 300, you stand out. So everything you do is going to be noticed. Everything you say is going to be noticed. And while people may say they don't have a bias, there is that bias there. And well, you, you only have to read, um, I usually avoid reading the comments section of articles on our local newspaper. But on this subject, I did go at one point and read the comments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's disturbing. It is. And people don't understand. You have to walk in someone else's shoes before you can truly understand. But what I just wish that they would do was, instead of being negative about it, agree to disagree, or open their minds and say, well, maybe I need to learn more about this before branding someone the way they do. I think one challenge with any of those academies also is that almost the whole student body is is far from home. Right, and that's in any college. It's in it is, and any any college that draws from the whole country, and so it could be very isolating for anyone who right. doesn't have much of a peer group. And if, like I said, if you're black or brown, there's not that many of you. Therefore, you're even more isolated. And to have comments being made to you on a daily basis, it's disheartening. And that affects your emotional well-being. And if your emotional well-being is affected, how you do in school is also going to be affected. And I have to admit, I love the, the, you know, the cadets in, in general because I like getting groups of students who you know, work, volunteer, cleaning up Riverside right. Park or whatever. Right. And 
You know, the cadets are a very hardy group compared to most college students. I, I remember once they were doing a, a, a service activity in April at, at Riverside Park, and like it was snowing in the morning, and I sent an email saying, now, do you want to reschedule? It wasn't a snow right. blizzard, but the snow was kind of coming down. They said, no, no, we can deal with the snow. You know, they, they didn't cancel. They still cleaned up. And I, I was pretty sure that most college students Aren't would like that, not no. have done that. <laughs> One of the things that Congressman Thompson said was that all the service academies, except for the Coast Guard, are you come in with a recommendation. The Coast Guard Academy operates like a regular college, and that's the difference. And he thinks maybe if the Coast Guard was more like the other yeah. service academies, you would see a difference in those numbers. Yeah. And it is an interesting thing to, to think about. I, I guess I wanted to ask Aileen, this is a question thinking about you know, Connecticut landmarks in the Hempstead House, um, is how do you see the role of the Hempstead House or the historic preservation movement in general um, to illuminate the role of African Americans in Connecticut? Yeah, we think that's a really big part of our story, you know, and so um, I think we're trying to put more emphasis on that than has been done before. So, you know, if you come to Hempstead Houses, everyone is supposed to know about Northern slavery when they leave. You know, a lot of times we have people who come who are just coming to see a really old house, you know, 1678, and so they're not sure what they're going to hear about. And so some people um, are surprised to hear about slavery. And so we've been really working um, to try and find different ways to get people to talk about this history. So we've um, been working with the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Um, to try and get our guides trained on how to dialogue with visitors about difficult history. Because you do find some, especially older people, aren't necessarily used to talking about um, slavery and you know what it means today for our society. And so we've been really trying to figure out great ways to get people to think about that. Even if it's not your own history, you know, how do you think this has impacted society? What's something that you care about? Because we kind of want people to leave. Their whole mission is you know, never again. So if you see an injustice in society, how can you address it? And, you know, the past does affect the present. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm not surprised that it, pe there isn't an awareness of it, especially among older people. I know my history books when I was going to school really had I don't remember ever hearing anything about slavery right. in the North. And, and that's, you don't want people to feel bad because a lot of people were never taught about it. And so you just want to make them aware, you know, why do you think that is? Why do you think people weren't taught about it? Just to get people to think about it. Now, I wa wondered if you could talk a little bit about other things going on at the Hempstead House, like general visitation stuff and other Yeah, programs. well, this year we're excited because um, anyone who's a new London resident gets to do any of their tours for free, which is a nice initiative for this year. We often have people that come in on the weekend that see, you know, the stone house open and they think, well, I don't want to pay. And so, you know, we're really trying to reach out to our neighborhood and really get people to sort of embrace that history to learn what's in the houses. So we're, um, that's one thing we're looking at. Um, also, our camp, we have this camp for students. Um, and so it's the last few days in July into that first week in August, running through August 3rd, kids 7 to 12. Um, and because of our grant from the Palmer Foundation, again, we're able to do, um, it's $50 for the whole week. They come from 9 to 1. Um, and if you need money more than that, we have scholarships so that we can offer a free camp to kids. So we're really trying to do more outreach to the students within our own neighborhood there and to get people um, to have a fun experience about their history. Well, it seems as though that neighborhood in general is going through sort of a revitalization. There are a lot of like families with, with young kids, elementary school yes. kids moving yeah. in. Yeah, we just had a meeting today, the Hempstead Neighborhood Association. They were saying they need you know more signs warning people to go slow because there are a lot of children playing. Um, so it is really nice. And you know, when I started, we had trouble getting some of the kids to come in, even if we had a free event. You know, they just weren't sure that they belong there. And, you know, so we want them all to come in. Um, we have community garden plots that a lot of the neighbors have um, in the front of the site. So 
A lot of people will come do yoga there in the evenings now. We really want it to be a nice green space for the neighborhood. And that neighborhood does not have a lot of green no, space. No, it does not. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. You know, because we have that field on Hampstead Street, but it's closed, you know, because it needs to be remediated. So it's yeah. a good space for people to use. And I have to say, Barbara and now Aileen have really welcomed the people of the neighborhood. The Hempstead House is not the same Hempstead House that I remember as a child. It was not welcoming. It wasn't even really welcoming to the students. Mm. They didn't want students of certain ages. You had to be older to go and visit. And Aileen has opened it up to everyone. Yeah, we really try and get students. And you know, this year we did in collaboration with um, the New London County Historical and Custom House, bringing all the third graders in for free visits so they could learn. You know, they're trying to learn their New London history. Um, so we really do want, and a lot of people are nervous to bring their kids to a historic house. So that's something we're really trying to change, you know, with the camp and, you know, we do our Hempstead Halloween is to really get people to feel like they can bring their kids there. Well, I'm guessing that most of the stuff in the Hempstead house, I mean, it's been around for hundreds of years. It's not that breakable. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we still encourage not to break, but yes. And, you know, that's one thing that's really changed at the Hempstead House in the last few years is, you know, we don't have ropes up. We let people into all of the spaces, even some of the things we let people touch now just to get a good feel for the history. Now, I guess we have, like, four minutes left, so maybe each of you can just say a little bit about how people can support your organizations if they feel so moved. They can stop by and see us at our table on Saturday. We will have membership applications. Membership is $30. We probably have one of the cheapest memberships in the country. Um, if you want to become a lifetime membership, that's $75 for 10 years, then you never have to pay us again. But we want to <laughs> see you out there. That's actually a deal. It is a deal. It is a deal. So, we, um, so you can come and see us. You can get on our mailing list. Um, if you have something that you're passionate about, come and see me. Maybe we have a place for you on one of our committees. We need people who have a passion for criminal justice reform. We have a criminal justice committee that takes complaints and works with people. We, you know, maybe go to the police department, find out what actually went on, so we need people for that. We have an education committee that has also worked with um, the Hempstead Houses and Benny Dover Jackson Middle School this year. We've worked with Jen in school also this year, so we have an education committee that's, you know, we need lots of people on. We have a lot of committees. We, we need bodies. If you have a passion, come and see us. Okay, and, and the table on Saturday is a good place right. to we stop have, by. Right, um, we have NAACP, Hempstead House, and OIC. We will have our tables together, so you will see all three of us together. Right on Hempstead Street, street. in oh, the street. street. So well, that'll be exciting. It, yeah. So you can't miss it. That's okay. Right. Right. One of us will always be there. <laughs> That's right. One of us. And so we have um, memberships as well. That's one of the ways we support our organization. People can join on an individual level, a family, and then you get into all the sites because we have sites um, across the state. So that's kind of an interesting way to go about it too. Um, and I did want to say for people, we do have one interesting thing coming up in Coventry at our Nathan Hale Homestead that I think people would be interested in, which is a vintage baseball game on June 30th, oh, wow. and it'll be um, an 1864 rules. And so they have a team from Providence and a team from upstate New York they are going to play each other so they don't wear baseball gloves. They're going to have their 1864 uniforms on. It's $10 no a ticket. No designated hitters either. I'm no, sure. I don't <laughs> think so. So I think that's something that's really an interesting thing because we do have sites throughout the state, and I think the one in Coventry is a good direction from New London if you're looking to go. And, you know, on every Sunday they have this huge farmer's oh, market. Oh, I think that, that just visit. started up for the yep, year, Yep, just right? this Sunday, June 2nd, was the first one or third. So, yeah, that's a great place to visit, too. And, and then, of course, the uh, Freedom Fund dinner is coming right. up the Freedom as well. Fund, June 28th, $65. You and can email me at unit2010 at newlondonnaacp.org. Okay. So thank you, Jean. Thank you, Aileen. Uh, next week, our guest will be Art Costa. He's going to talk about a uh, resiliency symposium that's coming up on June 14th at uh, Lyman Allen. So, uh, you know, like New, New London is always, uh, there's a lot to do here. Mm -hmm. So thank you both, and, and this weekend I will stop by. All right, I perfect. really am interested in the movie. See you all next week.
Thank, Thank you. Thank you.